Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Make sure you hang around to the end of the episode. We have a message from a new sponsor. Greetings and welcome to Voices from the Bench. We are at episode number 99. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. Congratulations, partner. I know. Can you believe it? The last (laughs) of the two-digit episodes. I know. Special. Next week is the big 100. I know, and I'm looking at our downloads, and um, we've got a lot of continuous listeners. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope we're keeping it entertaining for you. Yeah, we're definitely trying. We got some good stuff lined up in the coming months, so we're pretty excited. Awesome. Even though next week is our 100th episode, this week we need to focus not only on today's episode, but we're heading to Chicago in a couple days for a busy weekend of networking, learning, and podcasting. I'm super excited for Chicago this year. Same here. When this airs, we'll all be leaving. I think you get in on Wednesday, right? Yeah, I get in on Wednesday. I have a Cal Lab board meeting at 930, and then I'm doing the IDT Removable Prosthetics Roundtable Wednesday night, which I'm super stoked about. Yeah, they've done that a few times, but this is your first time involved, right? Yes, this is my first time, and I'm really excited. It's sold out. Ooh, nice. Some past podcast guests, Rob Cryer, Todd Young, Allie Williamson, and a bunch more people. So stop by. Actually, I don't think you can stop by because it's sold out. So if you didn't sign up, I'll see you on Thursday. Yeah, so really, I mean, even me, you couldn't even get me in. It's that sold out, right? Is that how I understand? Yeah. Wow. Sorry about your luck. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but you're going to be there with some big names. Steven Wagner, Valerie McMillan, Daniel Alter, Charles McClemens. I mean, this is a nice group of people. Yeah. Make sure while you're there that you tell a couple of them to come see us at the Argon booth and we'll have them on the podcast. You know I will. I'll be wearing my pin. Nice. I always try to talk us up, so you got it, partner. And then the day after, Thursday, we start the Cal Lab meeting. We talked to uh, chairperson Jeff Strunk. He was on the podcast a few weeks ago. There's still time to register if you want to attend one of the best networking meetings of the year. So make sure that you sign up. Then it's you and me at the Argon booth with a few thousand of our closest friends. I know that you got a lot going on that weekend because of your uh, presidency and all that. Yeah. But we will do our best to be at the booth as much as possible over the weekend. So if you know you want to be on, you can either send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com. And we've already had a, you know, a good dozen people reach out to us. Sweet. Or if you're going to Cal Lab, find us. We'll be around and we can try to schedule a time then. Other than that, if you come by the Argon booth... And we're currently not recording anybody. Just go ahead and sit down and let's have a chat. Yep. Or you know me. I'll reel you in. I'll come grab my arm and say, let's go. We love live recording. It's so much fun. It's a blast. And it's easy. And there's there's no pressure. So it'll be good. No pressure. Not no at pressure. all. But this week, we got an amazing interview on here. We talked to an assistant, turned technician, turned educator, and is turning into a denturist. We talked to Eugene Roizingert. Eugene is someone that you have seen speaking pretty much everywhere. And he's doing tons of hands-on courses at all these different events. He's always showing off amazing work that he does on Facebook. He's a member of the DTG, and he's all over LMT Lab Day Chicago this weekend. So go seek him out. But we actually talked to him about a month ago. And he talked about his start in dentistry, wanting to become a denturist, the process of becoming one, which was really interesting, and his mix of traditional techniques and the new digital workflow. So join us as we chat with Eugene Roizingert. Are you excited about Chicago Lab Day? Elvis and I are. NOAC Dental and NOAC Digital are. Their lab specialists will be at the East Tower booth B47, and their digital specialists will be at the new West Tower B2. 
Stop by both booths to learn about all of their offerings and to find out for yourself why Novak is the first dealer name customers ask for. Also, backed by popular demand at each location, they will be serving King Cake Vodka shots one hour before the closing of the show each day. So you know where I'll be. Don't forget to visit Noack Dental in both exhibit halls during Lab Day Chicago. And Elvis and I thank you guys for your support. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. All right. We appreciate Eugene Roy Zingert. Did I get it? Perfect. Yes, you did. Yeah, Eugene Roy Zingert for joining the podcast today. Eugene is going to be a denturist next week. Is that safe to say? Well, I, I have my clinical boards next week. I still have to do the uh, written exam if I pass the clinicals. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two parts to the boards, and once those are passed, then, yeah, I'll be a licensed denturist. I mean, I have a, I have a degree in denturism, but I'm not a licensed one yet. Nice. Awesome. You get the degree when you finish the school, but you get licensed when you take the boards. Exactly. That makes sense. So, Eugene, I see you at a lot of conventions. You do a lot of table clinics. You speak a lot. Where did I last see you? Uh, Eastern Conference, the dental laboratory. Yes. I tried to get you to sit down, but everyone was telling me that you're flying in the morning of and leaving the night of. And <laughs> yeah, That was kind of a weird, uh, weird meeting. I was doing a, a, a full day composite course with gc america and i had to fly out that night to alabama to do a lecture for vita actually for uh, uh implant supported prosthetics wow so yeah it was a really good weekend for me <laughs> yeah i'm i'm guessing you have a lot of those kind of weekends uh you know what i try to limit it to about twice a month nowadays yeah yeah just to make sure i do spend some time uh, with my family because Otherwise, my wife might just beat me. I don't know. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, you said you also own a lab. Where is your lab located? Uh, in Sandy, Utah. Uh, so nice. yeah, I, yeah, I'm a small one-person lab, and I, I specialize on, uh, nowadays, mostly implant-supported stuff. Wonderful. So how did you get into the industry? Who taught you the trade? So kind of a complex story, like most, most of us are, actually, I think. So I... Um, so I came to the States in 1994 uh, from Ukraine. And when I was in high school, uh, they had like a concurrent enrollment type of thing for dental assisting. And I've been fascinated by dentistry since I was a kid, which is weird because we don't have anybody in my family who's in, in dental. Interesting. So when I saw that uh, course kind of thing, I enrolled. It was me and 30 other girls. So don't ask me what they <laughs> <laughs> I know why you entered. <laughs> So yeah, and then uh, the course, you, you did the course and you had to do the externship thing. And then I found an office where I did my externship at. And I worked for that guy for, for many, many years. And I learned a lot of stuff about removal process at that office. And then and I also worked at the university hospital as a dental assistant as well. So, but uh, initially I, I I wanted to become a dentist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to school, I was doing my pre-dental was getting my bachelor's in biology and working as a dental assistant at the time. And uh, more and more, I realized I'm kind of more into lab work than I am into seeing patients. So I, um, I became a lab tech instead. And in 2007, I opened up my own lab, Apple Dental Lab. Hmm. And that was doing removal process, implant tissue supported, implant supported, implant retained stuff. And then... Uh, a few years back, about five years back, I was actually doing a lecture in Washington, D.C. at the National Denturist Association Symposium. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Todd Young. Hmm. And I always wanted to get a degree in something that I'm really passionate about. And since I never finished dental school, well, never even started dental school, let's put it that way, <laughs> um, I wanted to get something, you know, in removal prosthetics and everything else. And denturism was very interesting to me. And I wasn't able to do that beforehand because I would have to move, and I didn't want to move. Mm -hmm. that. And since this was an online, or partially online program, I decided to sign up. And now, so five years later, it took me that long. Well, the school is up wow. three years, but everything else and preparation, everything else, uh, I'm just barely now doing my boards. 
Mm. Good for you, though. Thank you. Taking the stamina, having a full-time job and doing lectures and educating and going to school all at once and owning your lab. That's pretty uh, pretty amazing. How did you come up with the name of your lab? That's also a very interesting story. So remember I was telling you guys that uh, I worked as a dental assistant for this gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. Who gave me my start and he taught me a lot of stuff. Well, the name of the office was Apple Dental. Uh, huh. So when I was opening up the lab, I was kind of like an homage, I guess, to the the guy that gave me my first job, gave me a chance. So I named my lab Apple Dental Lab. Oh, that's cool. I love that story. Yeah. How did that transition from dental assisting go over to lab? I mean, did you talk to the lab that that dentist was using and you, you asked to come in or... How did you get more hands-on? No, unfortunately, this was all kind of, I had to be self-taught pretty much. Um, <laughs> because at the time when I was doing it, uh, the, the kind of uh, situation in the industry was that everybody kind of kept to themselves and kept their own, their own knowledge and didn't want to share anything. Yeah. So I tried talking to the guys that were doing some lab work for the dentist and they kind of didn't want to share with me that much. So I did a lot of reading, a lot of trial and error, <laughs> and obviously taking some courses, you know, like an LMT and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. help out. But mostly just being self-taught until Facebook came around, and then it just kind of opened up all these wonderful possibilities and learning and everything else. And the guys in uh, the Dental Technicians Guild and Damaged Goods and all that. Like, yeah, yeah. Has helped me quite a bit. And there's way too many of them to thank, so I'm just going to thank everybody for helping me out along the way and actually still helping me. Wow. Sure. So you never worked for a lab? No. Nope. You went directly from dental assisting to owning a lab? Yes. <laughs> wow. Well done. Yeah, go bigger for her, right? And I'm sure you love it being a man lab. I'm sure it's uh, there's no late nights there and uh, crazy hours and crazy dentists. No, not at all. No, no, of course not. <laughs> I work, you know, three hours a day and two days a week, and that's it. Right? Yeah. yeah. And no weekends, of um, course. Oh, never. No. <laughs> I never work weekends. Yep. Do you get to do the dentist you used to work for? Do you get to do their work? Uh, you know, uh, as far as that gentleman uh, that helped me out along the way, he has since retired. Oh, okay. So I don't do any work for him. But I still, uh, University of Utah, uh, general practice residency, I work for them as a dental assistant, and they're actually my account now. Good for you. Oh, nice. Yeah. I was going to ask you, um, as a one-person one lab, how do you? Is it word of mouth for you? Just referral, referrals? Is that how you build your business? It is, yes. I don't advertise. Well, at least I try not to nowadays. I work primarily just with a handful of accounts. I have about four doctors I work with directly. And the rest of the stuff is just, uh, you know, this, uh, I've kind of given up quite a few of my accounts. So I, I, uh, I try not to spend as much time in the lab. Because when I started out, like everybody else when they start out, you work seven days a week, 20 hour days, yeah. you sleep two, three hours a night, yeah. and you just kind mm-hmm. of crank it out. All days I kind of concentrate more on the high end work and uh, implant support and restorations. Try to do it right, you know, the first time around. So it takes a lot out of you and that's why you have to only keep a few accounts. Yep, I agree. How long is your turnaround time, if you don't mind I ask? Uh, I do not have a set turnaround time. So I have, at the end of 2019, I finally made a transition from turnaround times to scheduling Mm -hmm. so i kind of operate my uh uh, laboratory as a dentist office pretty much so whenever the patient's being scheduled uh they give me a call and we check both of our schedules and i let the uh the clinic know when this case can be done and when it can be shipped out well that's got to be a great way to do business yeah something else already booked in that time slot we just have to push it forward so yeah that's awesome i wish we could do that <laughs> i you know i was many many years i mean i opened up my uh, my lab in 2007 so everybody always talked about it but i thought it was something out there you know in the neverland yeah just because i had no other choice i think sometimes you just like left left there <laughs> and you're like well i either have to close down my lab and go crazy or start scheduling cases yeah. So two three guys isn't bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to, especially if you're um, traveling, you know, two weekends a month and you've got to do it. There's no way around it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what's your work process like? I mean, are you totally involved with patients or are you 
working with offices where you're chair side to help, you know, establish that occlusion and well, since Utah is not a regulated denturist state, right? So I yeah. can't practice here as a denturist. I, I do work as a uh, as a technical mm-hmm. advisor per se to the uh, at this residency. It's not an official title in any means. Sure. So what I pretty much do is when the residents have an issue with their uh, removal prosthetics case, they call me up and we look at our schedules and now I'll, I'll stop by and just kind of give them direction on, you know, impressions, by registrations, things like that, I mean, kind of problem solving for them. Mm-hmm. But I do not work directly with the patient on my own. What are you doing in your lab? Are you using the IVO-based system? I am not, actually. I was kind of taught well self-taught pretty much uh old school ways i I always use brass flask and press packing trial packing technique yeah and i've had the iva cap system for a while that was just sitting there because i you know i bought it and i thought you know i was going to start using it and kind of everything else but we're technicians basically we're kind of set in our ways a lot of times and it's really hard for us to break that pattern Mm -hmm. for me the uh, press packing has worked for years and it worked well out, worked out well for me and i just kind of said you know what if it ain't kind of broke maybe maybe just should stick with it so i, I kind of still do press packing i mean i have no arguments that you know injection is a is a better type of process you get you know definitely uh, yeah. better but i have good fits with the stuff that i do so uh, to me it's 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 uh scientific versus clinical so scientifically, you know, injection like I have a cap, I have a base system is is probably better. But clinically, I don't see uh, I don't see a difference between that and press packing. So I, I've decided to stay with that system. Yeah, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So. Yeah, exactly. So do you do chair side conversions for immediate load hybrids? I have done those in the past. I don't do those currently. No. Okay. I am just I, I don't have the time. I simply don't have the time. And since most of my accounts nowadays. So I mostly work with prosthodontists nowadays. It just makes it easier for me and them. Yeah. And well, most of my prosthodontists are actually out of state. So I do not have any prosthodontists here in Utah. Um, mm. I work with guys in Texas and, and Puerto Rico and Florida. So for me to do a conversion is pretty much impossible. Cause, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unless they want to give you a free trip with it. So I have flown down to, uh, I have a, a very good friend of mine who I work with and, uh, in El Paso. I have flown down to El Paso a few times uh, to work on a couple of Excellent. difficult cases. Nice. So do you still have your assisting license? Uh, you know, you don't have to be licensed in the state of Utah to be a dental assistant, but I do have my dental assisting certification, yes. And certification radiology as well. Oh, nice. So you could actually sit chair side and it all be legit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. That's, that's great. So when you heard about denturism and you met Todd and you spoke for them and DC. What was the draw? I mean, what's the benefit to you? Because you mentioned that you don't really want to open up a practice. I've always been passionate about education. I've always yeah. wanted to be an educator and I, I like teaching. I like learning. And uh, I, like I said, I always wanted to have a degree in the subject that I'm passionate about. So being a venturist helps me in that sense that I, I got to learn quite a bit of interesting uh, stuff while I'm going to school and uh, learn how to do research also, not just, you know, not just book work. Uh, I got to do quite a bit of clinical stuff while I was doing my externship. So now I would like to help other people learn this same subject matter. So I'm, all, I'm also a uh, adjunct faculty instructor for the American Insurance College. And uh, so I, I did a couple of courses. Oh. In the future, I want to do more, and I want to do uh, a lot more courses, you know, traveling and stuff like that, and and maybe do a, a, maybe do practice part time. Yeah, I, I don't think I can handle full time practice, but yeah, maybe a couple of days a week or a couple of days a month, if that becomes a, 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 an available opportunity, I would like to do that for sure. Talk about the school and 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 when you got started, what were some of the early classes that kind of surprised you that were part of the program? So uh, embryology was one of the classes, the very first classes that I had to take. And I don't that, even know what uh, that is. Yeah, well, it kind of kicked my butt, to be honest with you, because I went into it with an attitude like, I got this, right? So, yeah. You know, I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing dentistry since 96. So in my head, I was kind of full of myself. I'm like, you know, I know everything there is to know. 
Well, uh, in reality, I didn't know Jack <laughs> when it came to book work because, you know, a lot of stuff that we do, it would just kind of learn hands on and just would do what we do. And we don't really know the reasoning and the, the science behind it. We know the stones set up. We know acrylic polymerizes and all that stuff. But the reason why that's happening, we don't really know it. Mm. So yeah. classes like embryology and uh, dental anatomy and anatomy and physiology. And uh, I mean, there's way too many to mention. Yeah. Sure. And uh, material sciences was actually one of my favorite classes. That's actually a class that I'm actually helping teach right now. And the reason why I love that class so much is because you get to figure out why the stuff does what it does. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, the different reasons behind it and the science behind it. So, yeah. So that was that was a really, really cool course that I had to take. That was one of the things that um, I enjoyed about studying for my um, CDT is there are so many things, you know, about anatomy and the, the muscles that I didn't know about. And so it opened my eyes to a lot of that, you know, higher learning. So I understand that. Absolutely. And I have to relearn all of it because I have to pass it for boards. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that, by the way. Yeah, I think I'm going to really need it. Yeah. Not so sure, but we'll see. I have a good feeling about it for you. Thank you. So do you find it difficult to do an online school? I mean, I would find it difficult to focus, honestly, and, and really get myself to to do it in front of a computer without the classroom setting. Did you find that hard? Well, you do have to have a certain mindset when you go into it. And they, you actually have to do some kind of testing. You, you have, they make you pass a little test to see if you're able to do that kind of learning. Oh, wow. It is not for everybody, obviously, yeah. That's pretty smart. I never would have thought that. Yeah. Oh, no. The way the program is put up is wonderful, yeah, when it comes to those kind of things. What is it? How you um, retain the information, learning from a computer, or what is that test like? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, you, you might want to ask Todd uh, Young more about that, because it's been a few years since I took that test, I so I can't really remember. Okay. Yeah, they, they do test you on all that stuff. And for me, uh I actually enjoy doing that in uh, on the computer because on online setting because I'm more used to learning things on my own anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, that's how you started, sure. Exactly. And then uh, it just gave me that avenue to kind of do things at my own pace mm -hmm. and uh, do the read when I had the time and do the classes when I had the time. So I wasn't really tied tied down by the schedule. Yeah. Well, at least not, not horribly. Like, you know, you have to go to class like 9 a.m. Oh, yeah. On the Monday. Morning. Yeah. That you don't have tough. that. Yeah. So that did really help me out a lot. Uh, and you do have interaction with other students and you do have interaction with professors because when I had questions about things, uh, the instructors do have uh, office hours and I was able to do video chat and kind of figure things out uh, what, what needs to be done. So it did work out pretty pretty well for me. Awesome. Yeah, that test to see if you're able to learn online, I imagine it's just reading something and then a Facebook notification pops up. And if you <laughs> don't hit it, <laughs> if you don't click on it, then you're good. Because that would be my problem. I'd be too distracted. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, you do have to shut down the Facebook when you're doing this because it will yeah. mess you up. And especially as much time as I spent on Facebook, that would have been horrendous. Yeah, I hear you. So when did you start getting into speaking? Was it while you're in in school or after or before? Actually, or? before I started. So in 2013, I think I did my first lecture. So uh, actually, no, I'm lying. Before that, uh, 2013 is when I did my first lecture for lab technicians. Hmm. I did a few lectures for dentists for the general practice residents uh, at the University of Utah. I did a few just kind of explaining simple lab processes to them. Mm -hmm. But in 2013, I did my first lecture for lab techs which was terrifying Oh yeah, uh, to me because <laughs> I felt like I was going to be called out any minute for not knowing anything. But Where then, was this? Thought, okay. Um, I think this was at uh, Lab Day West, if I'm not mistaken. Nice. Yeah. So I did a little lecture on uh, application of Gradia composite uh, onto dentures. So kind of one of those things. But yeah, it was that's a great first start. Were you already using the product before? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was using it before. Um, that was the reason why actually I got approached by the company because I was already using the product and yeah, they asked me to speak on their behalf. And it's kind of wonderful ever since. Mm. So explain to me what Gradia is. You paint it on the acrylic? Uh, yeah, so Gradia, uh, Gradia gum is what I use. Uh, so yeah, it's part of the Gradia kit. 
Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a, like your composite. Mm-hmm. So you can be used for many different, uh, many different things. What I use specifically is I do uh, gingival composites. So if you have a full denture, for example, I do a, a, a cutback on the acrylic, about mm-hmm. a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, and I layer it back in composite to get some uh, natural looking gingival effects on the denture. And we do hybrids with them, and uh, like if you do like a thimble bar, for example, with either lithium desilicate or zirconia crowns, and you can do gingival portion over metal yeah. composite. And I, I recently started using actually the newer Gradia stuff, Gradia Plus. Hmm. So I'm just kind of changing it up a little bit, always moving in the forward direction, or at least trying to. Sure. Yeah, that's a beautiful material. I've seen it a whole lot. I've always really wanted to try that. So I think that's pretty fascinating stuff. We had it here at one time. It's a lot of fun. It's very relaxing. You should try it. It's kind of like, you know, we, we don't really have time to go see like a you know, psychologist or something. I guess we'll go see a psychologist. <laughs> And it's either, either that or go start drinking. Oh, on yeah. The job. So we create. I, I yeah. composite instead. Yeah. Love it. Do you put that on every denture that you make? Well, I don't put it on if I'm doing like an immediate uh, yeah, yeah, temperate yeah. of Jesus. Uh, but everything I do that is a final, for example, don't do them on, on too many hybrids. Mm-hmm. I've done it on a couple. I'm still kind of waiting to see what how it looks like. But everything that's tissue supported or implant retained rather than implant supported, I definitely do. I do gingival composites on because you know, like I like I was saying earlier, I've kind of limited my lab uh, practice just to high end stuff, and to me, high end kind of requires that kind of commitment with composite and everything else. So yeah, but ninety percent of cases get composite uh, gingival. Wow, awesome. So what's next for you? So you're going to take your exam and you're going to continue to educate. And um, are you thinking that you might move to Oregon or is it just that there's licensing in Oregon? Uh, well, my licensing is going to be in Oregon. Uh, I also have a very close friend of mine that uh, lives in Oregon who keeps wanting me to move down there. Uh, I would. So <laughs> I'm a Utah boy. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of difficult for me to leave my home state. So I won't say no, like never say never, but uh I'm not 100% sure how likely it is at this point. I've been to Oregon my whole life uh, every other summer, and it's just uh, one of those places that if I had a, a pass, I would move there tomorrow. Love it there. It, it, it is wonderful. I, and, I, you know, me and my wife were talking, and I said, you know, if I, if I was going to move anywhere, it are probably going to be Pacific Northwest. Mm. Oh, heck yeah. Yep. You're taking your boards next week. Mm-hmm. What do you know about the boards? Has someone already walked through? Do you know what you have to do? Or Yes. So it's a fairly lengthy process, actually. So I'm taking my clinical boards next week, and it, it actually involves uh, a fully dentulous patient. Uh, on, uh, and uh, what I can actually do, the prep work that I can do is I can take the initial impressions and fabricate the custom trays before the boards. Mm-hmm. So during the boards, I will have to take the final impressions. I will have to pour up those final impressions. Create master casts. The master casts, I will have to do wax rims, uh, fabricate in the laboratory, and then do the bite registration, mount the case, set up a case, do a try in. And wow. everything that has to be checked off. And I have to do that all in one day. Oh, wow. Amazing. In one day. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, labor intensive and uh, nerve wracking. Is there one person watching you or is there multiple? You know, I do not know how many instructors are there. I guess it also depends on how many people are taking the boards. Oh, multiple people do it at once. I actually hear there's 40 people watching you, not to make you nervous or anything, but... No, well, actually, 40 people want that. You know, I have... (laughs) Yeah, no pressure. No No, pressure. Make sure you're a heck of a multitasker, though. It sounds like a big job, but if you're, you know. It is a big job, and I've been kind of trying to practice a little bit, you know, kind of trying to get things done quickly, so. You probably have to go out of state to do this, correct? Yes, so I have to fly. I'm actually flying to Eugene, Oregon. Awesome. Next Thursday. That's crazy. I'm looking at your name, Eugene, and I'm like, I wonder if he knows where Eugene, Oregon is, and that's actually where you're flying into. So that was going on inside my head about five minutes ago. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's one of the schools actually based out of, wow. which, which was actually, I have a funny story about that. So I, we have to do our lab work uh, for the for the school, and we have to ship it in to get graded, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then uh, when I took my cases to the post office, 
uh, they looked at my name and they also looked at the address where I'm sending it to <laughs> and they accidentally reversed the two. <laughs> so today I get my box bag <laughs> from the post office. So they used my address as the return address oh, instead of the shipping address. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that didn't mess you up at all. No, no, no. No, well, actually, this, the, the instructors at school were pretty wonderful. So I, I get to get stuff finished up when I have to. Awesome. I'm curious, and maybe you don't know this, but the patient you do your test on, are you making a denture that they get to walk away with and, and wear? Uh, unfortunately not, because it's the, the testing process is pretty kind of complex and pretty st- strict. So the setup that I do uh-huh. for try and that gets taken and shipped out to the Oregon whatever mm. health licensing and everything else. So it has to go to go to a few places. So I don't think the patient uh, will get the denture. I think I do get the denture back a few months later, but I, I'm not sure. You should sure. get the patient's name and then ship it to him. That'd be really nice. <laughs> I will, yeah, if, if that's a possibility. I mean, unless I screw up horribly. <laughs> I would love to maybe process it and give it to him as a thank you. Wow. Do you know if you get a patient that that has been wearing a denture or are you getting a patient that's never had a denture and you get to... So you bring your own patient. You're bringing your own patient? Oh, you pick your own. That's great. Okay. Yeah, you you, you get to bring your own patient. Yeah, they don't provide a patient for you, which is kind of, it's it's a blessing and a curse. A blessing, you have to find a patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you have to find a patient, but a blessing is is that you you actually get to uh, work on somebody that you you work with. Unfortunately, I don't. I'm not bringing my own patient. I had a friend in in Oregon find me a patient, so I'll, that's why I'm flying out on Thursday, so I get to meet and work on my patient a little bit before the board starts. So at least I'm oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. with that. Yeah, because I was smart. I was going to ask how you could find a patient if you weren't in a state that allowed you to see patients. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, my stepdad is full credentialist, so I was thinking, you know, if everything else fails, I was just going to bring oh, my there stepdad there, which is opens up yeah. another can of oh, yeah. worms yeah. right there. Yeah, working on family members, that's fun. I did my dad's uh, veneers, and there's a whole lot of pressure taking the exam, but working on a family member, that's a different level. Yeah, I think I'd rather lose a limb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. And then after that, you take the written test, right? Yeah, so it's not really um, – a set thing. It's not like you have to do one uh, and then the other. You can do one before the other. There's not a set standard of how they're taken. Okay. Is it for me? I because I can take the written one in Utah, in any testing center. I figured you know I'll do my clinicals first and just get that out of the way, and then I have to do quite a bit of studying still for my written board. So I'm I'm kind of waiting till last minute to do that. So I have a year to pass those. Is it just like a really big true false test or? <laughs> Uh, I think it's multiple choice, but I'm not yeah. 100% sure. I think wow. there might be writing involved, but it is a really big one. It's a very, you do have to study. It's not like you can just go in and pass it anytime. Sure. Before. Yeah. Hey, I got um, somebody standing over me. I have an emergency case that I need to go do. Um, I don't want to wrap this up too short. Are you guys okay if I step away? Sure. Do what you got to do. All right. Sorry about that. All right, we've all been there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Eugene. Thank you. Very nice to talk to you. You too. I will edit that and put it at the back so it'll sound like she's here the whole time. It's great. <laughs> exactly. Where are you speaking now? I mean, we're starting off 2020. I imagine your lineup, let's obviously Chicago Lab Day. I am. Yeah, I got actually quite a few uh, different uh, spots in Chicago booked up. Working with uh, GC America, with Video North America, with uh, Preet, with Wagner. So I got four different companies I'm working with in Chicago. Wow. Um, yeah, this was this turned out to be a really, really busy one for me, and I'm really excited about it, to be honest with you. Yeah. I've been prepping for it all year. <laughs> Is that four different talks? I mean, are you talking yeah. about different subjects on each? Wow. I am, yes, actually. Four different things. Wow. Yeah. When I saw you at the Eastern Conference, you do some of the smaller shows too. Are you doing any early this year? You know what? I got. Uh, I'm actually almost booked up for 2020. I only wow. got a couple of months left. Yeah, it's been kind of crazy for me. Thankfully, uh, before Chicago, actually, I'm doing a course in uh, Canada at Edmonton, hmm, uh, a two-day yeah. course, and then I got Chicago after that. 
yeah, I got uh, I got a couple of smaller shows. You know, I'm not. <laughs> I'll go wherever they'll send me. So I'm. Yeah. I'm not picky. I'm. I love meeting new people. I love talking to people. I love teaching. So, yeah, that's. I'm really looking forward to doing that. Do they come and ask you to do them, or how did? I don't know how it works. Well, I'm usually I get an email asking, you know, if I'm available to do something like, you know. Can you do like a two-hour lecture on implant-supported prosthetics? Mm-hmm. Go, yeah, sure. Which days? You know, and then I check my schedule and you know, kind of coordinate things. And when it comes to over doing stuff overseas, for example, like I do a, uh, I do a, you know, a course in Eastern Europe at least once a year. So you have to schedule it way in advance because you know you have to get things coordinated. Oh, sure. And I have to get organizers and everything else. And get things set up so i usually get that prepped about six months in advance so my next one right now in the books i got probably june in, in russia so wow we'll see how it yeah and language barriers not a thing or do uh, they it's translate not, well, I, don't know if I do have a, a little bit of an accent when i speak english so sure. i was actually born in northern russia and i grew up in ukraine so oh. uh, i do speak russian fluently oh there you go that helps <laughs> Every day, Russian fluently. I actually, when it comes to dentistry, it was it was very, uh, it was very interesting in the beginning because I, I didn't have any dental terminology in Russian. So my first few lectures were pretty funny. I, oh, actually I took bet. English words and added Russian endings to them, thinking maybe it will sound more dental that way. So, so I had to learn quite a bit of Russian t- terminology when it comes to dentistry. How old were you when you came to the states? I was fourteen. Oh wow, that's quite a transition at that age. I mean, and, yeah, talking about was, your whole world turning around. Yes, it was. It was very, very difficult at the time. Mm, I can only but imagine. But it's been great since then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You seem like you've really made a mark in this industry. Thank you. I appreciate that. I see your name pop up and everything. Like I mentioned, my uh, GC America rep was here yesterday, and he hands me a new pantalip, and there's pictures with your name next to it. I mean. You're doing some good things, and I see you on Facebook a lot, and it's beautiful stuff. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. I try. It, it, it can be pretty challenging at times, but I try. Usually, we're pretty busy in Chicago, but I'd love to check out one of your talks maybe sometime. Oh, yeah. That'd be, that'd be great, yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Eugene. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I really, it's it's been fun. Good luck with your board exams. Thank you. And keep doing what you're doing. We need people like you in our industry to really spread the good word. And, you know, the more we can share, the stronger our industry can be. Oh, absolutely. I firmly believe in that. I think just by talking to each other and learning from each other, because, you know, not not single dentist, technician, venturist can know everything. You know, it takes it takes a team, you know, yeah. and by sharing and teaching each other certain little intricacies, we really uh, we literally become better ourselves. Uh, help other people become better and changing the industry for the better as well. Yeah. Even though we're all competition, we're not. We're all working together for the greatest good of the patient. And that's what it's all about. Absolutely. And as far as the removable prosthetics is concerned, there's like five of us left. <laughs> to, <laughs> to there's not much competition. That is very true. Well, before you leave, are you getting into the 3D printing or anything? Is technology something that you're grasping? I am trying to grasp yeah. it, let's put it that way. So yeah, I am doing quite a few things in 3D printing at this point. So about at the end of last year, I think around, I think October, I started getting heavily into 3D printing. So yeah. at this point, all my custom trays, all my uh, base plates, all my duplicate dentures, and all my surgical guides are 3D printed uh, in my lab. Yeah. So I digitally do it. Which printer are you using? Right now, I'm using a frozen Sonic printer. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So I'm I'm kind of looking into maybe in the future getting something like an Asiga or something comparable, Mm -hmm. probably Asiga. Yeah. Uh, But you know, this the equipment's changing so rapidly that every month something new, better and less expensive is coming along. So I think for now I'm gonna stick with what I have Mm -hmm. because it's working out for me fairly well. And uh, once something comes along that has a good price point and good quality, maybe I'll jump on. So, what are your thoughts on the printed denture? Ah, oh, man, that's a it's a it's a, a loaded question. Yeah, it's a loaded it's a question. Very, I know it's a loaded question. 
So there's a lot of things that are coming out right now that have a lot of promise to it. So I'm looking yeah. at this uh, new thing that came out with uh, Carbo with conjunction with Vansplice Serona, and I hear yep. really good things about the resins. But that system also has limitations. Nothing out there is perfect. Let's put it this way. Nothing out there will work 100% of the time. Nope. Unless it's what we've been using beforehand. I'm talking digital right now. What I'm thinking for me personally, I am not making any type of definitive prosthetics. Yeah. When it comes to 3D printing. I have made a couple of temporaries uh, that the patients can wear and then uh, switch them out to something that's uh, handmade restoration or yep. old restoration. Something like that. I, I honestly think within in the next five years, we'll have something that's going to be a, a good permanent restoration. But at this point, uh, nothing out there, in my opinion, is worth putting in long term into the patient when it comes to printed. Uh, it's a pretty popular opinion. Yeah. I hear it all the time. I want to say I have not used the Denseply Serona version. Yeah. Uh, I think of everything I've seen out there, if, if I take a closer look, that one might be the only printed that I'll probably consider doing long term, but I, I, I don't quote me on it just yet because I have not actually seen it firsthand. I've just kind of seen opinions on the subject. Sure, but it is also a limited system. Absolutely, but it's it's a start. It's a it's a big jump in the progress that digital printing is making, and I'm excited. I believe that within a certain, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I I think I think 3D printing will take over. Uh, quite a few processes when it comes to a mobile process. Yeah. I think we're going to be doing a lot of things with 3D printing. There's, there's, there's also a big question on, you know, cost effectiveness of things and return on mm-hmm. investment and everything else. You know, is it worth it to do these things by uh, digitally or is it just faster and cheaper to do them by hand or is it better to do them by hand? There's still quite a few things that, you know, doing things by hand works out for the best. But let's let's say for an example, doing base plates. I'm printing base plates mm-hmm. instead of doing it by hand. How how much quicker is it to do it by hand? A lot quicker. But the fit is better when you do it digitally. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't have the same polymerization shrinkage I do when I do use my light cure material. I mean, sure. adaptation is a lot better. You know, scanning the models in and keeping the file really helps out a lot. You know, there's a lot of pluses to it. You know, am I making any money on this? Probably not. Really? I'm definitely not, you know, I'm probably maybe even losing some money doing these base plates, uh, printing them. But it's it's kind of a learning process for me. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when I started doing composite, for example, when I was doing gingerbread composite on dentures, you know, f- at first I didn't even charge for it because I wanted to learn it. I wanted to see how well it looks. I wanted to see how well it lasts. So first six months doing composite, I didn't charge anything extra on that. So I'm actually losing money on this. So right now, when I'm doing printed base plates, am I charging more? No, I'm charging exactly the same I was doing before. So I'm, material costs are higher. I have to I had to buy equipment. I had to buy resins. Things yeah. like that. Uh, software, it all costs a pretty penny. So probably not making any money at this point, but I'm learning. I'm doing better. I'm creating a better quality. And down the line, it's going to build up into something else. What it's going to become, I have no idea at this point. I just, I'm just guessing at this point, and I'm being hopeful. But hopefully, it's going to work out. I absolutely agree with that line of thinking. I mean, even here at this lab, if we start getting into a new product or a new technique, I will find a dentist and say, "Hey, I'll give it to you at a, a the same price or a lower price if you're able to work with me and give me feedback." And it might take a little bit more time because we're learning this process too. And unbelievably, a lot of dentists are willing to do that. Oh, yeah. And I I work with a lot of friends, you know, and that's, I've been blessed that my lab and my practice, and I've been able to work with a lot of like minded individuals. And we've been, like with base plates, for example, we've uh, hit our bumps also. Sure. Because what happens is that, you know, if you don't do just the right curing protocols, and just the right post-curing protocols, things will dimensionally change. And the sad thing about it, they don't change right away. So I printed that clear base plate, for example. I cured it what I thought was properly. Mm-hmm. Because you, you have cure times of while you're doing it. And then you have cure times after processing and post-processing cure times. Yeah, sure. So you mess up on one or the other. What can happen with your base plate? Let's say I've done a setup on this base plate. Send it out. We did a try-in. Case comes back. 
and it no longer fits the model because the base plate kind of cured all the way through while it was getting shipped somewhere oh. and it just cooled on you. So yeah. you're like, well, we have to. So now I don't do any kind of clear base plates. Everything I do is, is has a color to it. So it has a better curing protocol, I guess. So things like this, you have to watch out for. Things like this, you have to learn before you kind of go head on first into it. Yeah, fascinating stuff. It's good to hear that you're progressing with the digital side because when you started off talking about using press pack and (laughs) brass, I was like, oh, no. And uh, no, it sounds like you're still on board with technology. No, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love technology, and I'm definitely learning a lot nowadays, trying to move forward. Well, as far as the brass flask, it's sort of just only one part of my of my thing, and there's just some things I just can't really quite switch onto something different. But I'm not saying I'm not going to either. You know, maybe True. down the yeah. line I'll finally make that plunge and switch the process around and do things differently, or maybe I won't be doing acrylic processing down the line. Maybe there's going to be something else, something better, something different. So you always have to, you always have to learn. You can't just, you know, close your eyes and pretend like it's not happening. Technology is moving forward quite a bit. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe you'll be 3D printing every denture at some point. Never say never. True that. Yeah. Well, Eugene, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and telling your story and talking about the denturist school. We're big fans of that part of our industry. And I like hearing people's experience with it. And good luck on your test. And uh, whatever you end up doing, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks. It was very nice talking to you, Elvis. Yeah, I appreciate it, sir. Thanks. Thanks. Whitmix is extremely proud to introduce the Whitmix VeraBuild 3D printer with features rarely seen in economically priced printers. Your lab or dental practice can now print extremely precise models and accurate surgical guides with slice thicknesses between 25 to 100 microns. VeraBuild is an open system printer, able to print virtually any 405 nanometer print resin using its advanced software and auto calibration. With a more than accurate build area, automatic and manual supports, an advanced slicing algorithm, and quick build preparation, the Whitmix VeraBuild printer is the ideal printer for your lab if you're just starting out or you want to increase your print production. See the VeraBuild printer in Chicago at the following Whitmix booth numbers. At Lab Day, booths D43 and E42. And at the Chicago Dental Society meeting at booth 2621. For more information, check out Whitmix.com, and we thank you for your support of the podcast. Wow, that was an amazing conversation with Eugene. We totally love his passion for education and his willingness to help anyone. During the conversation, Eugene was going to take the board-administrated clinical exam, and we are happy to announce that he passed, which we knew he would because he's so amazing. Congratulations to you, Eugene. All that's left now is the written exam, and we will have another successful technician turned denturist story. If you want to learn more about denturism and how you can either become one or, more importantly, how you can help it become part of the standard care in the U.S., they will also have a booth at LMT Day Chicago. Awesome. Head over to booth G33 to see some good people that want to make removable accessible to everybody. Awesome. Definitely go by and say hi to them. They're a good bunch of people and it's a good thing for technicians to look into. We cannot believe it's the week of LMT Lab Day Chicago. woo So make sure you come see us at the Argon booth and make sure you stop by to see all the great lectures that Argon has going on in their new lecture room located at the gold level in the East Tower. If you know what that means, you're smarter than me. (laughs) (laughs) The one called the 3D presentation, Zirconia, the final restoration, boldly go where no technician has gone before. Wow. Yeah, that Argon has done with Absolute Dental Services looks fantastic. It's a first for Lab Day. It's completely in 3D, the whole 3D glasses and everything. Super Yay. cool. So go All check right. that out. Argon.com to register for it. Other than that, we hope to see you there. Safe travels. 
And of course, we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Woo. All right, fireball. Let's do this. I want to take a quick minute to talk about an up-and-coming milling center that is absolutely out of this world. Huh, let me think. Who is it? Oh, I know. It's Alien Milling Technologies. Yeah, you're right. And by the way, they will be exhibiting at LMT Lab Day Chicago this weekend. So if you want to meet their team and see all their great products, this is the perfect opportunity to do that. So I'm thinking every year in Chicago, they launch new products or are they launching any new products this year? I have no clue. They usually keep it a secret until the day of the show. That's what makes it exciting. But last year, I will tell you, they launched the Alien Extreme. That's a zirconia that is 49% translucent with over a thousand megapaxels. Wow. One of the best materials in our industry today. And I know the year before that, they launched Stardust. That's a great name, which is a progressive translucent zirconia. That one ranges from 600 MPAs on the incisal to 900 on the cervical. Pretty awesome. Reminds me of David Bowie. Whoa. And now that you said David Bowie, we owe them $50. Yeah. Well, one thing I know for sure is that they will be giving away their gaming mouse pads again, which is huge. Hmm. Not only is it just a regular mouse pad, it fits under your keyboard, it fits under your mouse, and it also has a killer dental illustration showing teeth numbers to help out the text. It's very handy. I can't tell you how many times I hear tooth number 19 and I have to take three seconds to think about where tooth number 19 is. That is super cool. As long as I've been in the industry, I still have to count my teeth. And from what I've seen on their site, they are giving away an Alienware laptop. Oh, that is awesome and totally right. One lucky winner will take home an Alienware M15 laptop. If you know anything about Alienware, these are top-of-the-line expensive laptops. Very cool. So the rules of the game are not posted, but they have assured me, because I'm super competitive and everybody knows that, that there's no luck involved. It will all be skill. Sounds fun. Sounds like it could be dangerous. (laughs) Who knows? Aww. Make sure you stop by their booth in Chicago. That's booth C30. C30. And we appreciate your support of the podcast, Alien Milling.